everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk. My name is Mark. We tape in Southern California, but it feels like the Winter Olympics in here right now. <gasps> so thrilled you are joining us today on this Tuesday. Hope you had a nice long weekend for President's Day. On today's show, Burt Reynolds is back. Black Panther crushes, and the Transformers might be new er faster than we expected. Starting off today, Miss Perry Nemiroff. Oh, hi guys, what's up? Oh, you, uh, you. Yeah, I, so I'm freezing right now, but the benefit of that is I have a nice booster seat from my big fluffy sweatshirt. Oh, it <laughs> is cold in here, does not seem to be affecting the sleeved one, Mr. John Schnapp. That's right. Uh, bring on the winter, baby. East Coast, come on. Love winter it. is coming, Christian. You're an East Coaster. How do you feel right now? It's been cold. Uh, okay, all right. Starting to see some, <laughs> some some cracks in the armor for Christian Harloff. Well, we had a very uh, interesting opportunity, and we love doing so this weekend. We got to celebrate Black Panther. Black Panther Unmasked, hosted by Brisk. And this was basically an event where John Schnapp, Joel Monique, and myself got to do a live version of Movie Talk from downtown Los Angeles at the Black Panther event. And we welcome to the stage Ruth E. Carter, who is the costume designer for Black Black Panther got to interview her. That is all going to be up on Collider Video's channel soon, possibly even today. It was such a great experience, Jeff. I had a great time chatting with Ruth, chatting with you guys, celebrating Black Panther. How do you feel about the event? Did we do okay? I thought the event was great. I mean, Ruthie Carter is so amazing, and uh, everything that she did for Black Panther, she's a, a great costume designer because she cares about her craft, and she makes everything feel like it's lived in. So when you go to actually, when you go to Wakanda and you see some of the costumes and wardrobe that she put together, it feels like you're actually just visiting a real place because everything like is put together like a real way, in a real way, it doesn't just fall apart. So here's what I did is because this thing taped downtown and so afterwards I was like, oh, you know what? I'm feeling good, I'm charged up right now. I'm gonna walk the two blocks to Staples Center and I'm gonna go to the slam dunk contest and I'm gonna go to the three point contest. And then I looked at tickets. You know how much tickets were for Saturday night at no the NBA All-Star game? How much? $3,200 for what? premium seats. And I was like, I can't afford 200? that. I definitely would have bought them for yeah. 200 I would have snatched those things up left and right for $200. I thought I'd be able to get a cheap scalp. No such luck. You know who can afford tickets? Black Panther and anybody involved with it because right. that movie demolished <laughs> expectations, grossing over two. dollars Hundred million dollars for its three-day weekend. That's not even counting the Monday of President's Day. Its four-day haul is actually two hundred and thirty-five million dollars. There were some other players. Peter Rabbit showed up too. He made twenty-three million over the four-day weekend. Fifty Shades Freed was number three at a little over nineteen million dollars. Jumanji: Welcome to the Jungle still chugging. Christian ten million dollars and the fifteen seventeen to Paris nine point one million dollars. Black Panther is no doubt the star. You guys have been hearing about it all weekend. That initial projections had this movie just under $100 million a couple months ago. Then some nutcases like me online started saying, this could do about $150 million. And then John Roca won up me. And then Clark Wolf was the first one, to my knowledge, had said, this is going to do over $200 million just for the three-day weekend. Perry Nemiroff, nobody enjoys crunching the numbers, and nobody's more accurate than you when it comes to box office predictions. Usually, did you see this coming. Did you set me up just like that so I had to apologize for picking on you for saying 150? I, I really, I obviously never expected this to happen. I, really, ever, even though the initial predictions were just under 100, and that sounded reasonable to me, but every single day we creeped closer to that release, and especially after the first reviews started coming out, yeah, I started to get the sense that I was going to be wrong, but I didn't expect to be as wrong as I turned out being with this. That That is nuts. And the fact that it is now the fifth movie to crack $200 million for its opening weekend is just crazy to me. And the, the best thing right now is that it kind of has a clear path to continue making a ton of money in the next couple of weeks because the only really big blockbuster it has in its way, in the most immediate future at least, is... Uh, a wrinkle in time, and that's not coming out for another couple of weeks. Like, yeah, we have movies like Game Night and Annihilation, but we're not talking big blockbuster type releases with, you know, 4,000 plus theaters uh, of distribution. So I think this thing is in really good shape. And I looked up some, so of the five movies that have cracked $200 million opening weekend, we've got Avengers, which dropped 50% weekend one to two, Force Awakens only dropped 40%, 
Jurassic World also dropped 50%. And then Last Jedi dropped 67.5%. So I'm taking that one out of the equation for for a variety of reasons. But looking at either 50% or 40% for Black Panther, it's tough to say because I'm looking at 40% because this movie is just making waves like nobody ever expected. And at this point, I don't want to underestimate it yet again. But Force Awakens did have the boost of being the first Star Wars movie in however long. And it also had the boost from Christmas. But Black Panther, like I just said, has no competition in the next couple of weeks. So I really wouldn't be surprised if it came closer to that 40% weekend to drop. And that would mean a crazy amount of money yet again next weekend and probably the weekend after. Yeah, I don't think Annihilation or Game Night are going to be taking down Black Panther at the box office this weekend. Schnepp, do you see this thing holding on that strong as Perry might estimate with 40% to 50% drop? Or do you think it's going to have one of the larger drops just because it made so much money opening weekend? I don't really see it dropping too much. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to be going back for repeat viewings. That's what this kind of film... I, I know a bunch of people have already seen it three times. I mean, so... Uh, it's got a kind of a, an exciting buzz to it right now because it's a fun film. So I think it's not going to drop that much in the second weekend. It's obviously going to break a billion dollars. So, yeah, hats off to Black Panther. I'm very happy for it. Yeah, Christian, here's something fun is that uh, this movie's already made more money domestically than Justice League in its entire run, than Logan in its entire run, than a whole host of movies that we celebrate as hits, and they are. But Black Panther is just demolishing box office records now. Let's not forget about the fact that, I mean, look, you talk about Force Awakens was December, which was which was new, and like, oh, no movie's ever cracked 100. And then you look at the other movie, April, I think, was Fast and Furious, and Jurassic Park was July. February, this is February. This also proves a lot of different things to quote, you know, fill the dreams. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not, there's no, I don't think there's any, and maybe even January. I don't know. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but the point is. Which is the what? Toilet bowl movie season. <laughs> but if you put the right movie in any month that if you build it the right way and you promote it the right way and you get type of expectations the right way, people will go and see it and in droves. And this also became like an event film. And I know that I just love to do it at this point, but it's true. My mother-in-law came over the other day and she's like, the Black Panther film, is it worth seeing? And I'm like, how do you know about Black Panther? <laughs> because you know, it's like this, the fact that she wants to see it and she, and she heard about it, she wants to go, it's great. Word is spreading to all audiences. And another big story though, because we've covered a lot of the, how much Black Panther meant to people, what it did. We also got to look at Jumanji. Like when you keep cracking in those punches, a ten million dollar punch after being out since what the beginning of December. That's why that movie has made an insane amount of money. Right. A clear question was posed. Um, that I can't remember which it was movie talk or whatever it was. But will um, Rampage make more money than Jumanji? I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, we talked about how we get, could Rampage yeah. be The Rock's highest grossing I, movie of all time. This is and, this is going to be hard for for this is going to be like his his big championship run because it's just it's it has that kind of magic behind it. Um, Peter Rabbit once again we talked about that last week. The reason why it, it, there's no other movies for younger kids to see, but the overall the big story of. Black Panther making 235 million in four days. Good for Ryan Coogler also. Right. He deserves it and get him to do more stuff. Let him, this is gonna let him do more stuff. He's gonna do smaller films, Star Wars film. He's gonna do a bunch of different things and <laughs> maybe James Bond, we'll see. Could Ryan Coogler do a James Bond movie or could he step up his game even more so with some robots? Because we're talking about a Transformers reboot and it could be in the works sooner than anybody might have imagined. That's right. According to Transformers World 2005, a new team at Paramount is looking to reset the Transformers live action movie series after the release of Bumblebee the movie. Is that what it's called? Bumblebee the it's movie? Bumblebee. Dear God. The news comes from the recent Toy Fair 2018 in which Hasbro previewed their toys and film tie-ins in an investor preview. This means that the planned 2019 release <coughs> for the Transformers 6 will most likely not happen, although Hasbro has dated an untitled Hasbro Paramount event film for 2021 that could serve as a reboot to Transformers. No official confirmation has come from Paramount at this time. Christian, we live in a world that is different than the movie landscape was 20 years ago, because 20 years ago, you worried about rebooting movies too soon. When we had Bat Nipples come out, we're like, damn it, now Batman's ruined for at least a decade because we can't make another Batman movie, it'll confuse audiences. And then the Hulk happened, and then we got the Incredible Hulk four years after that. And now we see new superheroes coming in all the time, and we hear that Warner Brothers wants to do like nine Joker movies at the same time. So my question is actually a reverse of what it was 20 years ago. Do you think that we waited too long 
to reboot the Transformers universe that fans are now so sullied by the Michael Bay Transformers that we don't want to see any more Transformers? Uh, it's circumstance, and it also depends on team. It depends on who you get. It depends on if, if, it's, if it's more of the same, if they hire, you know, you bull to do it or something. You know, if they get somebody to that, when you when you look at the the movie and you're like, ah, there's going to be no substance. What has this person done? Oh, I did this crappy movie. Or this crappy movie. You got to go big or go home. You got to get somebody that you wouldn't expect. You know, you have to get. I'm not saying you're going to see a Martin Scorsese Transformers movie, but you know what I mean. It's like when you hear these movies about when Suicide Squad was popping around, you're like, oh, Mel Gibson could do it. This person could do it. And, he, and Robert Zemeckis could do it. Uh, what, I think that was Zemeckis was supposed to do. He was going to do the Flash. The Flash. Point, yeah. He was supposed to do yeah. the Flash. So when you hear names like that and you hear that they're going to be able to build it. I still have not seen the Transformers movie that I, I was a, a, a big Transformers fan like the 1986 film I think it was my was my favorite, still my favorite Transformers movie of all time. Um, I think I know some people really like the first one. I didn't even like the first one. I thought it was kind of goofy with him going with Optimus Prime going around the house and the jokes, the humor, the Michael Bay humor ruined the entire franchise for me. I want to see a more serious Transformers movie. I want to see it more about the actual Autobots and the Decepticons and I want to hear like Megatron and, and Prime doing what they were supposed to do and it never still hasn't happened, but it depends on the team. It depends on the writers. It depends on how they put it together. I'm not going to say, yes, they should do it right away because I don't know who they have to do it. But you're such a Transformers fan and you seem so disenfranchised with the five movies we've gotten and the rest of the world feels the same way to a certain extent because they still make money, but it's been diminishing returns at the box office both domestically and internationally for each subsequent Transformers but, movie. So what can they do do to sell a huge former fan like you on this new movie. Well, I just said really honestly, there's two. There's, it's very similar to Masters of the Universe and very similar to He Man. I keep losing people left and right. I was, I, you know how badly I want that. It's sci-fi. It's fantasy. It's Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars. That's what it should be. And I watched um, uh, Ragnarok again. The way that they set that that movie up with fantasy and magic meets technology. That's kind of what He Man should look like. When when you have uh, Idris Elba walking through those, that, that part of Asgard, like that's what Eternia. That's the closest thing I've seen to Eternia. And it. And it's because of what Taika did and how he brought it to life. So the answer to the question is, it just depends on who is going to do it. I don't want McG doing one of those movies. I don't even want Goyer doing one of those movies. I don't want uh, uh, Michael Bay or anybody who's not going to... When you look at what Kevin Feige and crew did, or even you look at like what, what, um, what Patty Jenkins did with, with Wonder Woman, it's, you take this property, you take these things serious, you build up the character. You look, perfect example, again, you go to Black Panther, and you build out all the characters. Don't just focus on the hero. Make the villain memorable. Give me something like, make it count. Make it all count. But like the Bumblebee movie's coming out, right? <sighs> and, and the thing that... <laughs> that He-Man and Wonder Woman did not have to worry about is somebody confusing that property with a movie that came out five years ago. Because we haven't seen a He-Man movie, a real He-Man movie ever, and we haven't seen the Masters of the Universe since 1987. Wonder Woman, we hadn't seen her live action since Linda Carter. So it's a much different yeah. hill you have to climb versus the mountain of convincing an audience that this is very different than the Michael Bay movies. Because I love Optimus Prime. I'm not sure what you do with that look that is all that different than what Michael Bay was able to do. So when you see a, tra a trailer for this new Transformers rebooted franchise snap in 2021, how are they going to sell us on the fact that this is a different thing? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of latitude you have with Transformers. <clears throat> I think the Transformers Michael Bay universe is not for me. <clears throat> I don't like any of those films. So I mean, I know there's a lot of fans who like those films, but uh, I think if they go to the shared universe with G.I. Joe, Micronauts, all these other characters that they're going to try to put together with Transformers. Transformers will be coming out after they've already launched G.I. Joe, after they launched Micronauts. I think you have a chance, to, even if you look at the design, we have a picture of the design right there. Optimus Prime doesn't look like Optimus Prime. He looks like a Giger alien version of Optimus Prime. They can make it a lot cleaner. So I think there's a lot more to do with the Transformers franchise, especially by rebooting it now. Let Bumblebee be the swan song for everybody who's liked the other Transformers films, and then just do a straight up relaunch. Uh, Perry, do you like that idea that we relaunch Transformers, but we tie it into a the, the dreaded buzz phrase shared universe? I'm kind of open to it just because 
I don't think Paramount really has a choice. If I'm looking at it from the studio exec perspective right now, I think they made the smartest possible move by announcing a reboot, and especially with that slate that was apparently released during Toy Fair, where, what was it, G.I. Joe, then Micronauts, then Dungeons and Dragons, then an untitled Paramount Hasbro event film, which we're assuming is the first iteration of this new Transformers film franchise. That gives them three other shots to spawn another gigantic franchise along the lines of what Transformers was able to make before with the buffer of knowing they have a new Transformers in their back pocket just in case those don't take off. And if they do take off and then they can tie it into this new Transformers, that could be the difference between that version and the version we're dealing with right now that could make it feel different enough that could maybe make people more open to going back and experiencing another. I just feel bad for Travis Knight in this scenario, though. Like, What does this mean for his Bumblebee movie? Because even if it is a huge success, because that movie is still kind of tied to, to this place, world. It takes place in the past. It takes p- place right. in the past, but yeah. aren't we still dealing kind of with the same Bumblebee that we would have in, in these other movies? So is the slate just wiped clean regardless of how his Bumblebee movie does? I mean, yes. I, w- I would be up for that, but also like, if you have a Bumblebee movie come out, I don't think it's like the worst thing in the world to just have a standalone Bumblebee adventure that we all see and it's a fun movie and then it ends and then we can reboot Transformers in a different way. I don't think that's... The big crime here has been me wasting years of my life, it feels like, in the theater watching the first five Transformers movies. It's not going to be if you tack on a Bumblebee movie that might be the best of the Transformers to date. Well, now that... We know that they're rebooting it. I wish we could go back in time and instead of (laughs) Travis Knight making a Bumblebee movie that is connected to these movies that we all, most of us at least, do not like so much, I wish they would have let him make a stop motion Bumblebee movie. You got to be careful when you go back in time because you go too far back, then Merlin starts cracking jokes and Uh, nobody wants that anymore. Here's an interesting question, Christian, because I know you love shared universes. What if there's a G.I. Joe movie currently on the slate right now for March of 2020? And then there's also, like John Schnepp said, a Micronauts movie that is later in 2020. And then there's an untitled Hasbro project set for release October 1st of 2021. How do you tie these movies in? Do you drop hints? Do you drop post credit scenes at the end of G.I. Joe? Or do you just let them each be three standalone movies and then try to combine them yes, after the fact? That's that's what you, you should do if they have learned nothing from the uh, dark universe is that you should set the movies up first. Let people care because if they s- announce this is all going to tie in together and it, and it blends in and the first movie stinks then they're left with you know egg on their face again just like that would happen again with Dark Universe. That mummy movie was crap. I mean, even the even the, uh, the the Dracula movie which was supposed to be the first one that set it up and that was garbage and like oh no no no, no don't worry about that one. Worry about Look Tom Cruise movie star mummy. Uh, oh we hate this. Oh don't worry about it. You don't have to see Russell Crowe do that ever again. Um, and now that they don't want that to happen with Transformers. So, and I'm not saying they're going to do this, but what they should do is exactly what you just said: set these movies up, different franchises. Because what's GI Joe going to look like? Because we've had two different versions of GI Joe that <laughs> haven't been great. It's like, how are they going to approach that? Who are they going to? Same conversation we just had. Who's going to be the person, the director to bring GI Joe to life to make people care? So I would, I would just wait. Release them all, and then if people start to care about them, then mix them together. Shinab, is that how you see it? You agree with Christian? I absolutely disagree with Christian. I, I think how it, dare I, you? I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to use uh, Iron Man and the and the Avengers initiative. That's the way you do it. Like you let the movie be standalone, but then you add a tack on thing. It's like I know there's some people who hate these post credit sequences. I'm not one of those people. If you're going to see a movie that is a big blockbuster film that's already saying, "Look, we're part of this big thing," and you're like, "Well, how are they going to tie it in?" You don't have to stick around but for those who want to stick around after credits maybe there'll be a like an all spark or maybe that'll tie into the micronauts then the micronauts movie will tie in maybe there's a miniature transformer or something i I don't need them to connect and like have a weaving story i mean the mummy didn't really even connect that much except for russell crowe doing that start off thing and i gotta be honest i didn't hate the mummy i finally saw it on an airplane like last month but enough for you to want to see an entire universe based on all that's that's what i'm saying but it didn't have me hating on the fact that if they did bride of frankenstein 
that, and they were able to weave the mummy in there. Right. You know, I mean, look, I'm not saying. Did they bring... cut out the airplane sequence on the airplane? No, they didn't. That was all, that was my favorite part. I was like looking around, and people were like, oh. right. But that's you know? the thing, that though, Shane, that sometimes we have to, also have to look at outside of just being fans because, sure, and a fan point was, God, give it a shot. Let's see what happens. But there's a lot of money to be lost when you just give it a shot. And I'm not saying with Transformers that if they put a little thing at the end, that's what I'm saying. Right, There's I understand. No money I understand. Or even an no, Easter no, no, egg no. in the middle I, of it, where it. you don't, you wouldn't even pick it up, and What's then you that? hear somebody write an article like about Godzilla. it afterwards. Godzilla yeah. did a couple of things like that. Godzilla did it so well. Yeah, they had, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They See, had a bunch of different. Things. Godzilla, I thought, did it right. And if they do something like that, sure, to where you're not just making make really keep watching because we're sharing this whole universe. Because Marvel is different. Because Marvel is really the first people to the first one to really do it and start to have everybody start to try to copy you because just by throwing it in the end nobody was really doing it so it's like oh avengers what's that mean they're never gonna get all of those movie stars together to do that right. and then they did it so it, a dude shows up and is like i've got to talk to you about the all spark initiative <laughs> you're be like, what the hell are you right. ripping them off yeah. hot rod is that the voice yeah. of judd nelson yeah <laughs> perry i think we do a we, we we do like a tease in a gi joe movie that's not a post credit scene it's just like like you see the rock running by something Thing. And then just like, oh, that was an AllSpark. It clearly has like an Optimus Prime or a Decepticon or an Autobot logo. And then Micronauts is where people are one going to go see Micronauts because they're going to hear there is a post credit scene hinting at Transformers. Or is that I know you're skittish on, on shared universes have too Have we early. all forgot the fact that these movies can have trailers before it too? It's like just everything that's being pitched right now feels like it's a, like a teaser trailer to their next movie. Why don't they just run a teaser trailer before their new feature film and then all of a sudden you remind people that you have another property coming out based on a Hasbro no, that's product. Too, that's too simple. It must be woven <laughs> right. into the film. Well, it must be woven we, in. Because if it's done right, I think that the point is that it just it's cool to think like all these things exist. My my problem with it is the fact that it's just we you can't guarantee that the movie will be good. And if the movie's really good, and at the end they go, well, check out this cool thing that might be happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th things like that, are, It's I understand why they would do that to try to connect the properties together. But I just don't think it's necessary. They haven't earned it yet. I until agree. the Transformers I, I totally franchise, and until this whole Hasbro Paramount operation earns my trust, yeah. I don't, I don't want to touch that. I, I want agree. whatever they work on first after the Mumblebee movie to be a great want, standalone movie, and then, yeah, fine, I'll be open to post credit scenes. I want to see G.I. Joe riding a Jeep that turns into a Transformer. Did you read the comic? The well, G.I. Joe, I yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, and they, they blew up Bumblebee. It better not happen. Oh, you mean the tr the, the comic G.I. Joe versus, all the, Gio no, Gio versus Transformers? I don't mix comics like that. Yeah. Uh, so well, but you mix movies. universes. I do. Yeah, I, yeah, love, I love uh, shared universes, <laughs> but just not in comics. No, I, I love shared universes right. in comics. I love the amalgam. Check that out, right. where they like wove Captain America and Batman, all these characters, together. It's always fun to see that. That's why I, I'm all for them trying to make this work. And I don't mind. I'm not joking when I say I don't mind seeing a Transformer in a G.I. Joe film, especially if they're trying to do a shared universe, why not? They all live in the same universe. It just doesn't have to be centered on the yeah. Transformers. But the G.I. Joe is like a secret organization. They're like, yeah, we've got a couple of these I think things, we're all saying know? the same thing. We just want, like Perry said, we want to see them earn it. Like, like put out the movies first, be good. And then, then, then because really, isn't that what Marvel did? Yes. I mean, nowadays it's really popular to have a writers' room where you're planning ten years into the future. But I'm sure Marvel did plan a little at the time in they case their movie work, was though, successful. Yeah. But it wasn't. Hey guys, we're gonna have a writers' room for ten more films, and you guys just sit and wait for our first one. Right. Hopefully, you like it. And you want to see the rest. All right, it's a consensus. They want to shoot Micronauts, GI Joe, and Transformers at the same time, just like Lord of the Rings, and then <laughs> release Back to the them. Future oh. Two and Three. I'm saying, you know, I love the shared universe of Robo. Cop versus Terminator. I'm still waiting for that right movie based on the Dark Horse comics and the Super Nintendo game that I was great at. Well, now it's time for agree or disagree, but today there's going to be a calm surrender to the rush of debate, and that is because we're talking about The Lion King. God, I love Can You Feel the Love Tonight? And don't worry, you're going to get to hear it in the new live-action quote-unquote movie. This is according to a report from The Sun. Elton John has revealed that only four of the songs from the original Lion King soundtrack will be included in John Favreau's version of the film. Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Hakuna Matata, I Just Can't Wait to Be King, and Circle of Life. John also said that he's looking forward to working with collaborator Tim Rice and Beyonce and a new song for the end credits. So what this means, John Schnepp, is that there's five well-known songs from the 1994 Disney's Lion King, and the one that gets cut 
Is Scars be prepared? Is that the right tune to lose, or would you rather have them cut one of the other ones? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it this way: the Jungle Book was fantastic. They cut out almost all the songs, and I didn't. I didn't. At first, I was like worried about it because the Jungle Book animated movie was one of my favorite childhood films. I knew Baloo's all of the songs, Bare Necessities, and you had Bill Murray kind of like, you know, just saying, you know, humming the Bare Necessities for like. 14 seconds and that was enough you have christopher walken kind of doing his his kick-ass uh you know uh king louis uh song but not really and that was enough i don't need to see I, it's cool enough for me to see like lions talk you know in real life i don't need to see him <laughs> sing and i don't care about that so, i don't know that they're going to be singing i mean that, that's the thing with this report is like I, I i love elton john he's one of my favorite artists of all time but i don't know that he's the go-to source as to exactly how these songs are going to be utilized in the new version i think that he that he's been told they're going to incorporate them somehow, but they were incorporated in the Jungle Book, just not in the way that we saw them in the live, or excuse me, in the animated version, because these were full on like music videos that were woven into the fabric right. of that movie. I don't think you're going to see the same thing. I think you're going to get hints of those four songs, and then they leave Be Prepared behind. So Elton John is going to be like some singing gibbon on a mountaintop somewhere. He's going to just, you're going to hear Elton John all of a sudden, you cut to a montage. I mean, I, I would be up for that. Can You Feel the Love Tonight is, is the one above all the other ones that I think needs to be in there, even more so than Hakuna Matata, which I think should be in there. The one that I could lose, to be honest with you, Christian, is uh, I just can't wait to be king. I oh, think okay. I, I think I was, that one could be Circle of Life. I get it. Got to have Circle of Life. Circle of Life is, of life that's is the, one the one you have one. to have. That that's, has to be it's in the there. opening. Yeah. The, I mean, even in the teaser trailer that we saw, I think that they showed that. I mean, yeah. look, the, the thing that you have to be careful with this movie is you obviously don't want to make a. In, just a remake overall, because not only was it a great film, the 94 version, but then they did a very successful Broadway run of it. Mm -hmm. So, and they did all of the songs and added new songs. So you got, you have to be careful. You don't want to do the same exact thing, but on the same token, the difference between like Jungle Book songs and Lion King, besides the, I think the Jungle Book was like 68, 69, yeah, yeah. something along those lines. And you know, you had a little bit more of the generation that were used to the songs, ready for the songs. So it worked to go into the Broadway version for Lion King. They're so memorable that people are gonna wanna see them. I think that the Scar one is actually the right call because it's also maybe they're trying to do they're trying to make Scar a little bit more intimidating. Maybe they're trying to make him more vicious. And if he breaks out into song in an animated film, it, it works. It's fine. But if you break him out into song in this I know it's not live action, I get it. But like, you know, in, in this in this version of it that there people are gonna say, uh, yeah, he's a little goofy. Maybe they don't want him to be goofy. Yeah, and I don't even know if Elton John's gonna be singing the song. No, like, he didn't sing the other songs. He just only sang well, one of them. I, no, I'm talking about in the actual movie. Yeah, yeah. But, but, like, I don't even know if you're gonna see, like when you're watching the movie, if you're gonna hear lyrics at all. If you're, like, you might just hear, again, notes of these songs that'd be, that are that'd used. That'd be better. I mean, I, I would, pers I wanna see that. And John Favreau already did Jungle Book, so he's probably gonna do the right thing and not have them bust out in a song, like animals like doing song and tap dancing towards the camera or anything. So. Uh, Perry, do you, do you agree with these? These guys that, that you think that we could just have like the, the hints of the songs. Do you need a full blooded version of one of these classic Lion King songs to play during the movie? No, I don't think I need it like we got in that animated film. And you know, when this graphic first came up, and I it's not just because I have seen that iteration of the lion actually perform some of this music, but looking at this photo real lion, this real lion, which is what they're probably gonna look like in the movie. I mean, look at it. Can you picture it singing and dancing like we saw in that animated movie? Doing that. Probably not. Oh my God! Oh, they did it with Baloo. Baloo did it. Maybe a little, but not really. So Just a little. I, but I can uh, see Timon I, and Pumbaa doing it. Yeah. But it, 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 look, lions are majestic creatures. Okay, it's hard to see that type of animal singing and dancing. But like a warthog or whatever the hell the other one was, I can see that happening. Well, maybe like a little bit of a like a light dance along right. to it, where, where it feels just the slightest bit more natural in whatever kind of tone they establish. You guys are I th crazy. I think you. I think you're out of your mind. <laughs> You're talking about ant lions talking that, in the first place. That that's cub, crazy. That cub is going to be singing I Can't Wait to Be King because a, a, a cub that's singing cute. a song that's is cute. cute. That's cute. He's going to sing that song. Get used to it. He's singing the song. Remember that little wolf? Oh. Where's Mowgli? Exactly. That See, that's, cute. that's the one that, to me, does not work more so than any of the others because Circle of Life and yeah. uh, Can You singing. Feel the Love Tonight, right. <laughs> we didn't off. really yeah. see them sing, I mean, any of the lyrics, if, if any, maybe just a line or two. It, it's mostly... 
atmosphere and feeling in you're, those scenes. You're and, not wrong. That that scene could be silly if you if because can you can you feel love Sunday? It's it's essentially uh, Simba and uh, Nala singing to one another, and if you if it doesn't look. Great, and even if it does look great, two lions singing a love song together could live could be weird. But hey, I want to I want to see them take it to the. I want um, this to get National get Geographic. I want <laughs> oh, it. No. I want to see how do you get lion cubs? There's only one way to do it. There's no magical stork <laughs> like at the beginning of Dumbo. I want to see lions going at it in oh, this movie. Am I the only one? Absolutely not. Yeah, you're the only one. <laughs> Maybe it'll be on the, uh, the deleted scene menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now I want to see Lion sing. Yeah. I'm just saying, look, the, the, the song taught me there's a rhyme and reason to the wild outdoors. And that rhyme and reason, there's only one way to rock, baby. Let's make some lines. Okay, well, Burt Reynolds has probably made a lot of lines in his day. Ryan, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> Burt Reynolds, who has no relation Him to too. Ryan Reynolds, has had a very storied career in Hollywood, starting out as a college football player for who, Christian? Florida State University. Very good. Very good. The first trailer has been released for A24 as the last movie star starring Burt Reynolds. The movie sees Reynolds as a former Hollywood idol who gets invited to accept a Lifetime Achievement Award at a film festival. He then discovers that the festival is a low-rent fan event held at a bar. The film also stars Chevy Chase as Vic's encouraging friend, Modern Family's Ariel Winter, and Hot Tub Time Machine's Clark Duke. It will open in select theaters in New York and Los Angeles on March 30th, 2018. You watch this trailer, and Christian, you're giggling already, and I'm not sure why, because here's my... I don't know if you got a chance to check this trailer. Yeah, but I did. There's, there's movies that come out, and this felt a little bit like the movie Lucky, starring Harry Dean Stanton, where it's, a, it's this person's actual career through a funhouse mirror, and Harry Dean Stanton gave a performance that I thought was Oscar-worthy. Unfortunately, the movie itself and the production did not was not allotted the $5 million budget to start pitching itself. That was a very politically driven Oscar campaign that that movie fell short of financially, and that sucks. However, you also have movies that come out like Robert De Niro in The Comedian, where it's a reexamination of somebody's life. Where Robert De Niro did, was never a stand-up comic, but he played one a long time ago in another in a Martin Scorsese movie. So that also could be seen as looking at how this movie is going to play out, or this could just be like a JCVD situation or the Jean Claude Van Damme show, where it's, you're looking at your career through very different eyes. Do you like where this movie's headed? I like that Chevy Chase looks like he looks like Doc Brown just let himself go. Uh, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> He does. He just. He, that is amazing picture of Chevy Chase. Um, the trailer. There was another movie that just came out over the award season with Sam Elliott. That was the, the hero. The hero, yeah. which was similar. It's really good. And it's similar, yeah. right? And I. That's the first thing I thought of was I just seen that trailer. I saw both the trailers together. But it looks like a movie, like you said, with Harry Dean Stanton and. Um, and Burt Reynolds just like kind of go for it. Let yourself go. Be vulnerable because that's he looks. Very vulnerable when you think about the type of movie star that he was and then the parallels that this movie's going to do. Now, this could be a movie that you watch and you say, well, yeah, Burt Reynolds gave it his all, but it's fairly familiar or even forgettable film. Or it could be the opposite. It could be one of those movies that you just say, wow, that you want to talk about a guy that has always had it and my God, he's back again and watch this movie. That's also a possibility. It was a good trailer and it had me kind of, you know, I remembered it immediately when, because I, I watched it, I guess, when it first came out, like a couple of, was it like, three, four days ago, whatever it was, and I, I'm i curious. Uh, Perry, are you curious like Christian, or do you think this is just going to come and go and we're never really going to talk about it come award season? Nah, I'm not curious enough to watch it. Uh, I remember when this premiered at Tribeca, because mm -hmm. I had a couple friends who covered Tribeca, so I was keeping up with some of their reviews, and I saw a few for this one, and given just the little bit of those reviews that I did read, I see those problems in this trailer. And even if I take the reviews that I read out of the equation... Such as? Um, well, some of the stuff that they said is that he's got his moments in the movie, but for the most part, it feels like he's sleeping through it. Uh. And I could see that maybe a little bit in the trailer, but really taking the reviews out and just looking at this as a trailer that's selling the movie, it's a bad trailer. It is a very poorly cut trailer. I love trailers that stitch together a story in a way where it doesn't feel like highlight, highlight, highlight. I hope you see our movie. It feels like a natural mini version of that story. And here it's just fade to black, fade to black, weird music cue, ugly driving shot that looks like it was done on a green screen. This did not sell me on the movie at all. Wow. I mean, I, I disagree that it's a bad trailer, but I think that they did give away a little too much because you feel like you've seen the entire movie, or is there something we're missing, Schnapp? I don't know. I, I feel the opposite. I actually lo I love the trailer. Um, Adam Rifkin is the guy who wrote and directed it. Uh, he's uh, done the Dark Backwards. He's done Detroit Rock City. He's done a lot of different kinds of films, 
And uh, for me, like I remember hearing about this film and I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool idea to try that with Burt Reynolds. He's got a lot of, I mean, if, if you've never seen Smoking the Bandit or, you know, Longest Yard, he's got a lot of comedy chops in there. He's also, you know, probably a tough guy to work with. You know, he's, he's long in the tooth. His career hasn't been doing stuff in a long time. So this is that kind of film where it's like, it could go one way or the other. For me, I was waiting to see the trailer. I feel like it's gone the way that I want to see it. Like when I first heard about it, it could it could be making fun of somebody in a bad way. It could just it could go all those routes. And I feel like this is that kind of thing where it's like people realizing where they're at in their life and kind of dealing with it. Like the whole idea of like let's have this uh, you know come to this reward ceremony. It's at a bar. I mean, I can imagine now. I'm imagining stuff when I saw the setup of some of the follow up scenes. So for myself. I was very excited to see what this film is offering, so I can't wait to see it. Um, I'm kind of excited to see like the movies that they invent that he was in right. that are yes. going to mirror totally, like either Boogie Nights or Smoking the Bandit or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, Deliverance because like I like one of the things I really liked about Funny People is that Adam Sandler is yeah. playing a version of himself, <laughs> but like he has all these like horrible movie posters on his wall that made yes. like gobs of money at the box office. And they so. pretty much made all of those after Funny People yeah. came out. Sharky's Machine, right? Yeah, yeah. what's it? <laughs> Listen to I mean, play a shoe Malone. It was because Burt Reynolds was nominated for uh, for best supporting actor for uh, Boogie Nights. Do you remember who beat him? Uh, no. Where's Rachel Cushion? Robin Williams. Robin wow. Williams beat him oh, for Good Will Hunting. Hunting. And I remember being yeah, like, well, I, I, you know, Burt Reynolds, it would feel like a Lifetime Achievement Award, and he, and he was great in the movie, but I was rooting for Robin Williams that night. So I think most people were, but... Anyway, all right. So there's that movie coming out. And then we got one more disagree. Agree or disagree. And that is about Jamie Lee Curtis is gabbing about the Halloween remake. And it sounds pretty good in her words. Astonishingly scary. This is according to Jamie Lee Curtis's own social media via a report from Bloody Disgusting. The movie is a direct sequel to John Carpenter's classic, The First Halloween. So it picks up after the first Halloween. John Carpenter, by the way, is also returning as an executive producer and don't worry, John Schnepp, he is a composer on the film yeah. and it's set for release on October 19th of this very year. Will the movie live up to its pedigree? But Jamie Lee Curtis is saying yes. John Schnepp, what say you? Well, the full quote is astonishingly scary revisit to Haddonfield, but I I think yeah. what she's trying to say is this is going to be a return to uh, if you loved Halloween, you're going to love this. So I love everybody involved in this. I, I think it, if everything feels right, like I don't I don't mind throwing away ever all like the nine or ten other sequels because you could always watch them again. If you don't like this, you can go be like, well, look, we've got all these other sequels. If that happens to be the problem, <laughs> maybe you yeah. prefer season of the yeah. witch. Hey, Here you go. I like and I actually love season of the witch. Come you on, do. don't be crapping on that. Halloween about. three. What's up, son? <laughs> so anyway, look, I love that they went back to uh, the original Halloween and doing a uh, whether it's Halloween one or two. I'm still I still don't know the whole story if they follow it right after Halloween one or Halloween two. But I think it's great that they got Jamie Lee Curtis back and then it's her daughter and then her granddaughter and the shape is back. So knowing that John Carpenter's doing the music, everything about it feels like it's like all the people involved in it, Bloomhouse, everybody involved in it uh, loves the original Halloween. So I can't help but feel like it's going to be an incredible sequel. How could this movie elevate the scares though? I mean, what do you think it's going to do that is going to make it worthy of the first Halloween movie and separate itself from the rest of the sequel? I think it's going to take the tone of the first Halloween film. You can watch the first Halloween now and it's still frightening and scary. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to emulate that feeling and that tone. They're not going to go for the cheap jump scare. They're not going to, they're not going to go for the cheap scare. I mean, I feel like even if you could say, one or two scares and Halloween could be a cheap scare or whatever. They're going to do that. They're going to emulate the original Halloween. So I, I feel that's how the, they're going to do it. Perry, do you agree with Schnepp that the first Halloween still holds up as one of the scariest movies ever made? Oh, absolutely. And I think they're going to, I think they're going to go for the shape where you just have this feeling where you're searching the frame for wherever he could be and you don't know what's lurking in the shadows. And, you know, some of the kill sequences in that movie, the, it, it's not about what we get now, excessive gore and mm -hmm. jump scares. It's it's the way the score kicks in and out and just the sheer brutality of it. And as sick and twisted as that sounds, I hope they tap into that a little more than the flashier scares that we're used to right now. I'm really excited for this too. And I have all the faith in the world because especially because Blumhouse is risking a lot on this for a company that specializes in making horror movies to take on one of the most iconic franchises of all time. They better have had a good take on it. Other 
otherwise, it's going to be a pretty big blemish to the Blumhouse name. It's different than creating your own franchise and maybe screwing it up with a second installment. This is Halloween. They can't mess it up. The only thing I wish didn't happen is Jamie Lee Curtis taking to social media to say it's astonishingly scary because having having made a horror movie, something might sound scary on paper. Something might look <laughs> scary on set. When you get in that edit bay, it might not look scary anymore. So before you plant that thought in my brain and say that something you saw is astonishingly scary... I don't know. Just just wait to use those kinds of words. I got to disagree with that because I think that you're looking at it on the inside film bubble to where you, you, if, you, if you're from the mass audience, when the star of the film, people who like for the casual movie f fan, that, and they just like horror movies in general, and the star of the film is, is saying that, you'd be surprised how much of an endorsement helps like that. So when she comes out saying that, and plus the fact going off what you're saying in regards to um, hoping that Blumhouse has a good take on it, you would assume that they did if John Carpenter is involved. I mean, honestly, he would probably put his name together on, on it, but the fact that he's doing the music and everything and, and coming back, and I'm not the biggest horror fan, but this movie intrigues me very much so because it's also one of those experiments I thought was going to happen with with Alien, what, what they were going to do with um, with Neil Blomkamp when, when we thought that it was going to retcon everything after two, after Aliens, and I was like, oh, let's, I'm curious to see a movie do that. And whether it's a horror movie, a fantasy sci movie, any type of movie, retcon. Like, I wish Rocky, Rocky, you know, Balboa would have retconned all of five. You know, I, I, I want to see a movie where retconning happens and how it works. <laughs> they kind of did anyway. I mean, they kind of just like Not really. Ignored. It was still in Philadelphia. Yeah, but they ignored all like the, the, the CT implications yes. that could have been yes, like, like right. happened. No, it was like his, his brain just magically healed. But the fact that they're, they're doing this, I couldn't agree more with both. Schnepp and Perry, that this movie needs to feel and look like the first Halloween, and because Blumhouse is doing it, make it look not cheap but lower budget. But qu okay, quick question here because you, I'm not going to say you're the easiest person on the panel to scare, but you're definitely the hardest person to please when it comes to a horror movie. Yeah. Do you and Schnepp agree with Perry that this is a risk not just for the Halloween franchise but for Blumhouse because they've knocked it so consistently out Perry of the saying, park? Yeah. Do you think that it's also a big risk for Blumhouse that if this movie comes out and it doesn't do well or it's bad, that they just keep on going and making great horror Yeah, movies. I mean, I agree with what Perry was saying. I think that it's a, it's a risk because it's part of this franchise. If they throw out movies on their own, then it's, ah, they tried an original movie and it didn't work on in the next one, but it's the Halloween name, so there's more of a risk involved. But they're also a little Teflon ish right now because they make so many movies that turn so much profit that they could survive it. There's no doubt about it. But I agree with Perry that it's 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 a risk to do it with this name. They yeah, could I, survive it. If this movie comes out and it crushes it with critics, the box office fans, everything, <laughs> you're gonna have so many people out there calling for all those other great horror right. franchises that were never done justice in future installments. Everyone's gonna want those to go to Blumhouse. And who knows, that could possibly happen. Yeah, I, I zero risk. I think it's like they smoked out with uh, Carpenter, like McBride and Green were like, we've got this cool idea. We're going to bring you on, like have you do the music. And it's like a true sequel to the original Halloween. I think the idea itself is so original and fun to go back and like, we're not going to even talk about those other sequels. We're going to go right from the very early, right. the very first one. I think it's a fun way to think about it. And yeah, why not do that with other films? I wouldn't mind seeing that with Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, there's the the sky's the limit. And I think the budget on this is is something where Bloomhouse, it's not going to affect them at all so but i don't think that's even the, the, the that's not even a an issue for them right. I think is michael myers so. gonna have bad knees though because he's gonna be in his mid 50s or 60s right? well it is the original guy yeah, playing like the shape it's, it's, yeah. it's nick castle is playing yeah, that I mean, character he, he just kind of lumbers along well anyway. they also have yeah. a stunt man also mm -hmm. playing him so he'll be around when you need him to stand like and then the stunt man is jumping through windows yeah, it's yeah. A peter mayhew yeah. Playing, yeah. playing chewbacca kind of thing well yeah. if you are a horror fan and you're looking forward to halloween you're probably gonna enjoy our recent crossover that we did with ash versus evil dead we have lady Ladies Night that is now up on the channel. Bruce Campbell joining some ladies here at Collider as well as the Celebrity Schmodown where Bruce Campbell was kind enough to announce the match with myself and fellow horror enthusiast Mark Riley with some members of the cast of Ash vs. Evil Dead. You can check that out on Collider Video right now. Subscribe here. Tell your friends about all this cool content like Heroes is going to be up tomorrow. We have another Schmodown that is already up and that is myself versus Jeff Snyder. It was a very entertaining match start to finish. I mean, was my intro 
throw better? Of course it was. I'm baby Karis Ellis. Check out the match and see who won right now up on Collider video. And last but certainly not least, check out all the Black Panther content that we have. We have a spoiler review, a non-spoiler review if you haven't seen the movie yet, plus a end credit scene explained, which is a really cool vid. And then obviously our Black Panther Unmasked that we filmed live this weekend is going to be up on the channel very, very soon. Speaking of Ryan Coogler and what his future might hold, our mailbag today surmises that maybe he could be taken over for another huge franchise, and that is from Jake Ryan. He says, hey, Collider nice. crew, couldn't help but notice some tweets this past weekend from Sony's 007 account in which they shared an image of Daniel Craig as Bond, almost as if they were reminding us that he's coming back. But to do it in the middle of the Black Panther opening weekend, is that just Sony's way of hinting at a Ryan Coogler-directed Bond movie? No one just debunked rumors he'd taken on, and Coogler worked with MGM on Creed, so I'm wondering if you think it might be the same thing. Thanks. Um, I wouldn't look that closely into it, Jake. And I know that our buddy Jeff Snyder did, in fact, tweet that and w was intimating that this could be because they're trying to get some sort of symmetry with Black Panther and James Bond. I think Ryan Coogler would be a fantastic choice to direct James Bond. We've seen how he's been able to reinvigorate a franchise like Rocky before 007, possibly. I just don't know that this is particularly any indication. This could just be Sony wanted to be like, hey, uh, this is on our time watch, so we need to release this this weekend and I don't know that there's a whole lot of fans out there that are outside of our movie huge fan bubble that are aware that Ryan Coogler is the guy that directed Black Panther and then we see an image of Bond so we're going to correlate those two maybe I'm wrong here Christian do you think that most people saw that tweet and were like oh Ryan Coogler would be great for double most Seven. people no insiders yeah did sure. your mother-in-law see that tweet she what was that? Um, I yeah. like James Bond. Yeah, right. A bluebird flew by. Yeah, me. no, no, no. There, there's the, no one. No one would pick that up unless you're in, inside of the industry. And you're Love your stuff. There's, there's, there's no way. But um, I also don't think that it's a. It's. It, would it be a great choice? Yeah, I mean, even look at some of the stuff that he did inside Black Panther alone. There's a lot of Bond esque type things. The whole inside casino of, scene. Is yeah, a for sure. Scene. Or even even the stuff that his sister was was pretty much Q. You yeah, know, there, totally. there was there was so much that he did there. You could tell and. You see him with Kluger right now. You know, I want him to get past the uh, the Ben Affleck, not curse, but Ben Affleck went three for three, and then his fourth movie, not so good. Um, I want him to go four for four. And whether it's Bond, whether it's Star Wars, whether it's something smaller, whatever it's going to be, this is the type of director. This guy is young. He is hungry. He is passionate. He is absolutely barn on one of my favorite people working right now for the amount of love he puts in his projects. Um, so if it's if it's Bond go for it. If it's Star Wars, please and thank you. If it's something small, I'm good with it. I don't care, but I, will I, do I think he would be great doing a Bond? Yes. Do I think it's a guarantee? Not at all. Yeah, we don't have a release date for Cougar's next movie. It's called Wrong Answer, but I don't know if that might get delayed. It's also based on a work by Tanishi Coates, which is interesting. Michael B. Jordan's also going to be attached to it as of right now, but that could get put on hold if you have a project like Bond come along. Is that going to be the right project to put his other work on hold? I think any project he chooses is going to be the right project because someone in his position, and especially someone who has had that much success so far, has to know what the right move is for him before he actually commits to something. I think it's going to be stupid of Disney as a studio to let him go to any other studio. They should snatch him up ASAP for Star Wars or whatever else they want him to make because he is clearly a talent that I think is going to keep delivering, so I have a lot of faith in him. That tweet right there, I don't think it means much of anything because that Twitter account posts like every single day, maybe every other day. So I think this was just what happened to pop up in their planned timeline on Black Panther release weekend. Uh, Schnepp, which side are you on? Do you think that this maybe was more than meets the eye or do you think it's just, hey, he's doing Transformers. Yeah, yeah, it's it's oh, more than meets the oh. eye. I'm glad he picked it Turn it here up. first. Uh, yeah. Hey, look, Ryan Coogler <laughs> just made an awesome James Bond movie. It's called Black Panther. I mean, I don't need to see him. I want to see him make Black Panther There's too. There's a lot of Bond Bondian There's so much Bondian see, yeah. stuff in there. Like we could list off a lot of stuff, but I, I don't want him to go over to James Bond. I'd like to see him do another Black Panther movie and a bunch of other other films. I think he's an incredible talent. In fact, even that tweet alone just makes me kind of tired of James Bond. I wanted to see a new James Bond. I didn't want to see Daniel Craig come back. I thought Spectre was horrible. So I feel like, look, James Bond is that character you can always get new people to play James Bond just like Batman there's always a new a brand new person coming on to play James Bond maybe in three or four years maybe that's when 
Ryan Coogler should step in when they get a brand new James I, Bond. I actually like that idea better than him closing out the yeah. Daniel Craig. I mean, I, I would yeah. love to see Ryan Coogler do any Bond movie, but if you have Ryan Coogler come in, and because what he did with Rocky was not take Rocky for his last run as much no. as he introduced he a new them. central character yeah. into this universe. So if you can do that with Jimmy Bond, that's exciting and i kind of want to see wrong answer too because as much as we love coogler and michael b jordan working together i want to see coogler do any material that coats has out there yeah let's also you know put this in perspective i know like again i've been singing the song of coogler and i will say it he is a phenom he's like 29 years old or whatever he is i don't even know if he's 30 years is old is he really he's he, he might he might be 30 he might be and i and look at what he's done up until this point already the three movies fruit Val station Creed revitalizes, not revitalizes the franchise, but everyone pretty much said, what are you doing making that? He chose to make Creed. Right. That could, after coming off Fruitvale Station, he could have made a lot of different things. His passion for the Rocky franchise, pitching it to Stallone again, because Stallone said no the first time. Mm -hmm. Then Stallone saw Fruitvale Station and said, okay. And now everyone wants to see Creed 2. Now there's excitement for Creed 2 because of what Coogler did. And then he just, look what, I mean, what he did with Black Panther. The guy at 30 years old, let's say, let's call him 30, has so many movies out there. I mean, he's got 30, 40, 50 years left of making movies. Man, I really liked Ryan Coogler until you brought up his age. Now I'm just, now I'm just <laughs> bitter. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I, I have negative six years to catch Ryan Coogler and all his accomplishments. We're going to move on quickly to live Twitter questions. We love taking your live Twitter questions at the end of every movie talk. You can tweet us anytime at Collider Video. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. And our question today comes from Blue Leafs 13 and that is, which sequel are you more excited for, is the first part of the question. Is that Pacific Rim Uprising or Sicario 2? And which sequel will do better opening weekend at the box office? So I think I can answer for Christian. You, you're more excited about Sicario 2, probably, over Pacific Rim Uprising. Yeah. But which one's going to do better at the box office oh, opening Pacific weekend? Pacific Rim 2. You think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Pacific Rim 2. It's, 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 got, a, it's got a bigger appeal. It's, it's, it's popcorn blockbuster movie against a very niche kind of film which is you know it's gritty and and it's also rated r as opposed to pg-13 so yeah there's no doubt about it. it but i just loved sicario so much the first one i think there's a little bit of doubt because sicario i don't think is 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 i think it's transcended being a niche film i think more people are aware of it because of the success critically of the first yeah. movie, but I mean, Pacific Rim always, Uprising. Always transfer over to box office, though. It, no, it doesn't. But something like, like maybe like, like, like John Wick, where it came out of nowhere, then you have a big opening weekend for the second one. Am I just trying to grasp at straws here, Schnapp? No, I don't think so. But I mean, I, I prefer to actually, I'm looking forward to seeing Sicario 2, even though knowing that it's a different director, just like Pacific Rim, it's a different director. But for myself, I loved Pacific Rim. The first trailer that I saw for Pacific Rim Uprising, or, or what, what is it? Right. Is that the full title? Because sure. mm -hmm. um, they changed it a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was okay. But it, was, it didn't have that grandeur that uh, Guillermo had brought to the first one where you really feel like these monsters are fighting these kaiju. It's like robots versus monsters kind of thing. Um, we're definitely going to see that. I just don't know how it's going to do as far as even box office, let alone like the excitement level. I'm like, I'm excited to see it. I want to see it. But it's not I like when if you had like, what do you want to see first? I want to see Sicario 2 first. Yeah, I mean, it, like I was sold on Sicario doing something else in the universe. When I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, this looks this looks real special. So, Perry, because I know you love numbers almost as much yeah. as I do. So, the first Pacific Rim, when it came out, opening weekend in America, yeah. $37 million. Pacific Rim? E, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sicario, when it came out, it was limited release. And then when it had its first major worldwide or the nationwide release, it was $12 million. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to do a lot better than $12 million, But I also think that Pacific Rim Uprising is going to do a lot better yeah. than $37 million. I definitely think between the two, Pac Rim is going to make more money because, I mean, you said it. It's basically as close as you can come to a four-quadrant film. It's got a much wider audience that it could tap into. And, you know, as much as I want to see Sicario, I'm looking forward to both of these things. I really want to see both of them. If I had a pick between the two, I would pick Sicario too. But To see. To see. Yeah. To see first, at least. But I want to see both of them. I think Pac Rim looks like a lot of fun. I think yeah. Pac Rim, if it doesn't do well, it bodes really bad for the entire studio. And all. There's a, it has to be a giant hit. Right. They're also banking on Boyega. I don't think it's going to be a big hit. They're, I feel like it's going to be a medium, if mm. not a kind of a failure at the box office. That's a major risk for them, because I'm sure they're still pumping a ton of money into that movie. And yeah, th I mean, how long were we talking after that first one came out? Are they going to make a sequel? Are they not going to make Years. a sequel? And it's because that the final box office, even 
even though it made a lot of money overseas, it was still on the cusp of whether or not to spend an extreme amount of money on a second Pacific Rim movie. Look, it, it, it's coming out. Tomb Raider comes out the week before it in March. That's March 16th. And then you have Pac Rim. And then the next week, Ready Player One. So yeah. the, the summer season, Christian, we talk about it a lot on Schmoes. It just starts earlier and earlier and earlier, and yeah. it looks like it's kicking into high gear right about now. So get your popcorn ready, everybody. The summer season is upon us. That does it for us here at Collider Movie Talk for today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Again, you can follow us at Collider Video and subscribe right here to Collider Video's YouTube channel. For the panel, I am Mark Ellis at Mark Ellis Live. We'll see you guys tomorrow for a new Collider Movie Talk. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.